Hello, and welcome to this edition of In Dialogue, a Manil program series that highlights conversations with notable scholars, artists, and art professionals. My name is Paul R. Davis, curator of collections here at the Manil. And this afternoon's program, we dive into the cultural histories of three very special works on view in the Manil's Pacific Island Gallery and their important transactional roles in a multi-year mortuary rite ceremony in New Ireland, Papua New Guinea. As a reminder, you're welcome to send questions during the program by emailing programs at manil.org. Again, that's programs at manil.org. And we'll do our best uh, to answer as many as we possibly can. And with that, I'm excited to welcome Dr. Jean-Philippe Bolou, who joined us from late evening in France to share his insights and experiences with us. Hello. Good evening. Good afternoon, Paul. <laughs> by day and often by night, Dr. Philippe, uh, Dr. Jean-Philippe Bolou is an astrophysicist and a director of research at the National Institute for Scientific Research in Paris. He is also the endowed professor and David Warren Chair of Astrophysics at the University of Tasmania and a co-lead for the European Space Agency's Atmospheric Remote Sensing Infrared Exoplanet Large Survey or Aerial Project, which uses satellites to analyze atmospheres of planets outside of our solar system. A highly accomplished astrophysicist, Ballou started working with New Island carvers and families of carvers of Maligans during a visit to New Ireland in 2002. Now, almost 20 years into his initiation with Maligan tradition, Ballou's work with carvers in New Ireland and Tabar Islands continues. His forthcoming publication, Uli, Powerful Ancestors from the Pacific, is the culmination of the last six years of research on one specific type of Maligan carving, the fierce figural sculptures known as Uli. Uh, so welcome, JP. Thank you, Paul. So I think we'll start at the beginning and the end with the next slide. Yeah, for me, everything started in 2002. I was very curious about the Malagan tradition, this uh, extraordinary object that we're going to see. And I wanted to know if there was something was still alive. Uh, so I went to Taba Highlands, which is the origin of this art tradition. And then there I met this gentleman that you see on the left, Edward Sally, who was a master carver. and. Uh, very quickly, we developed a very good relationship, so he became a friend and my mentor. So he's the one who taught me about uh, the traditions. And uh, I did uh, six trips uh, to Taba Highlands along the years. Mm -hmm. And uh, sadly, as you see on the right, it's also an end of the cycle because uh, Edward has passed away uh, recently. And what you see on the right is uh, photos taken a month ago uh, for the funeral ceremonies. So the, the, the start of his ceremony, uh, funeral ceremony the start of a new Malagan cycle. Mm -hmm. And Edward was also very important uh, for, I would say, all the uh, New Ireland community because Michael Gunn, who is the best expert worldwide on New Ireland art, uh, started his field work in New Ireland in uh, 82 with Edward Sally. So Edward Sally also taught him. So he is really an important figure. He was someone very charismatic, full of humor, and uh, no, with a perfect knowledge of all the old traditions. And I think we have some of these these groups of people that you're talking about in the next slide with uh, Michael Gunn pictured there on the left. So this is a photo from a field trip we did together with Mike in 2018 when we were on the tracks of Uli figures. So the figures on the left was taken on a ritual site called Konobin in the hills, so very remote uh, spot. And on the right, we were analyzing some old recordings with one of the elders uh, from uh, the area. The guy was actually the landowner of this uh, place. So bridging the old times, recording from 1909, with uh, nowadays. And we have some of those to show, yeah. Um, and so these, these, these research trips have really uh, led you to do a lot of different projects. One of them is this amazing film that's streaming online at the, at, on, the, on the Manil's website. We can go to the next slide. So in 2002, when I arrived, uh, they, uh, it was a few months after the death of an important figure named Petsia. He was a ritual leader and a very charismatic person too. And, I, and they started to do the cycle of funeral ceremony uh, to honor his memory. Uh, and then I came back in 2003, 2004, and they were still 
working on the preparation of this big Malagan feast for this powerful person. And mm -hmm. then in 2006, uh, they invited me uh, to come to the, to the ceremony and they asked me, please come and bring a camera because we need to keep a testimony for the children. So it was at the invitation of the people from Tabar. So what we did is that, okay, we're coming. So I came with two friends, uh, Jean and Yadja, and we spent time there with a camera and we documented uh, the preparation of the ceremony and the ceremony itself. And then the movie was presented after in museums. But when we took the decision to go there with the camera, there was no plan actually uh, made with actually, museums beforehand. It was just yeah. after that it was done. So, so this raises the, the sort of the introductory question of, of what a Malagan is, um, because it's both the mortuary rites, these multi-year or, or ceremonies that occur over many years. It's, it also it refers to those rites, but it also refers to the objects that people carve and, are, and that are commissioned for those rites to be enacted. And yeah, what is complicated is, indeed, Malagan is the name of the ceremony. It is the name of the car of the carvings that are produced for this ceremony. It's also the name also of the masks that are being used. And these carvings are uh, linked, so are separated in different families. So you have groups of carving with specific types, and someone own a particular type of carving and present it uh, during the funeral ceremony if he has the right uh, to do so. Uh, so it's also a way to pay your respect to the dead. It's always so prestige because if you own um, several kind of malagans, you're a powerful person. And uh, it is really a system to uh, regulate the social relationship between the people because uh, everything is organized around these uh, big uh, funeral ceremonies. And, and so, uh, what, I mean, th this is the still from the film, but in the next slide, we have an example of um, this, the long durée of these, of these ceremonies. Um, you you mentioned that these were uh, shot, these, these images were, were taken uh, about several inches apart from each other, but 100 years apart, almost. So the, the two images, one image on the left was taken in 1909. So that's a Malagan feast uh, photographed by the German ethnographer Edgar Walden. So what you see is that you have a big house in the distance, and then you have some totem poles attached to it, some horizontal frieze. Uh, and then you have also a fence around it because it is a sacred enclosure. So when you are in this enclosure, it is for the men and the initiated. So the women are due to stay outside. And then you have people dancing in front of this Malagan house. So that's uh, uh, the 1909 photo. And the one from 2006 on the right, which is uh, from the film, is you see basically a uh, Malagan house with the figures presented on it, and then the Cook clan seated on the right with a ritual leader uh, speaking to the people, holding this big cap cap on the, on the chest. And mm -hmm. the enclosure was also fenced with a wall, but the people this time made holes in the wall so that the women and the children were not inside the enclosure but could be watching what was happening in, inside the enclosure. So that's, uh, they said it was an evolution within the tradition. <laughs> And historically, they were for forbidden to, to enter the, the enclosure. Well, normally, once you want to enter the enclosure, you have to ask authorization. So even myself, in 2006, every day when we are going to go and film, first thing, I was going to the main house, and we were waiting there for the elder, the one standing in the middle, to arrive, uh, to wait for him to invite us inside. I read this every single day. So it was basically the kind of common... Uh, it was all routine because that's a way to pay your respect also to the tradition. And then, so um, how, how much of the how, how much of these traditions changed over time? I mean, we're looking at over a hundred years uh, difference here. Hundred years ago, it was very much spread all over New Ireland. Mm -hmm. uh, now you only have uh, Taba Islands and several clans from Taba Islands, so you can view it as critically endangered because there is a very small group of people who are still doing it, uh, following the tradition. And it's mostly occurring on Tab Tabar Islands it's now? It's Tabar only, and uh, not everywhere on Tabar, because you have areas where that are really given away uh, all the old ways. Also now, most of the time, the Malagans are only uh, about pig exchange, uh, because what you do is that you present carvings, you do dances, uh, but also the important thing is that you have received, for example, pigs in a previous ceremony, so you have to give them back. So mm -hmm. there are lots of exchanges between the clans. You can also buy a piece of land. Uh, uh, 
And if you have a problem with one of your neighbors, that's also the moment to sort it out. So there lots of social relationships is happening at this moment. And the unit to deal with, the, with this is pigs. So you bring pigs that are sacrificed on the spot. So there were, for example, 34 in 2006. Uh, and in the ceremony we went in 2020, uh, there were 100 pigs. And in both cases, there were about uh, 10 carvings presented. And it's incredibly transactional. Um, and some of the transactions occur around these types of objects. So what you have, to, these objects, you have to own, to be able to present it in a ceremony, you have to own the right. So typically your grand, your uncle, during a ceremony, will give to a child the right to one particular Malagan. So for example, one called Valik. So he would give the right to either the wool Valik family of Malagans or to one specific. Uh, and later, you own this particular Malagan, so you have the right to ask a carver to carve it for you. So you go to the carver, you say, well, I own this kind of Valik. Can you make one for me? Uh, and then there is interaction between the carver and the owner. And then the carver does his job, and then the carving is presented. And the carving is presented and used once. Mm -hmm. Because this, uh, Malagan has a meaning in his making, and it is in its use, and it's a unique use. After they are of, they were discarded, burnt, or uh, or sold. So I don't know. It was uh, when the Germans arrived. It was okay to sell some of these objects uh, after the end of the ceremonies because they could be used once. You could not reuse them. So, right. for example, here you have examples, uh, all in uh, private collections, uh, two uh, superb masks and a Malagan figure uh, on the right. Oh, All of the mean, ones. And it just gives you an, a, an incredible uh, idea about the level of carving, the artistic ability, the creativity. Um, these are these are incredible examples. Um, but before but before we go too deep into what the objects are, and particularly the ones from the Manila are, maybe we should step back a little bit yeah. and see where we are. <laughs> yes, you're right. In the world. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide. And so. Uh, New Ireland is this long, skinny island uh, northeast of Australia and Papua New Guinea, an area of the Pacific, and part of an area of the Pacific that's usually referred to as Melanesia. Um, it's one of the larger islands that, that comprises um, the Bismarck Archipelago, uh, an area that was first inhabited uh, in between the 30,000 30, and 40,000 years ago. So it's an incredibly important region of, of, the, of Melanesia and uh, Incredibly diverse, I think, is what we can say. Uh, wouldn't you say so, JP? There's yeah. For so New Ireland, for example, it's this skinny island that is about 400 kilometers long and uh, 10 kilometers wide in its uh, sinus area. You had 20 languages and yeah. some languages being completely different so that you don't have a can't speak to your neighbor. So if we can go to the next slide, we can actually see some of this. Um, uh, the, the actual shape of New Ireland, how long and how skinny it is, um, and, and the islands that surround it. And you were working, JP, on uh, central New Ireland, that Mondek region, and as well as Tabar Islands, right? Yes. So this, the film that is available on the main hill site has been shot on Tatao, at the uh, breast where you have the black spot. So that's Tabar Island, which is the origin of the Malagan tradition. All what is in yellow uh, is following uh, Malagan traditions. Uh, the area that is brown in the middle, that's the Mandak country, it's uh, their own one kind of Malagan that is called the Uli. And that's what we're going to be talking uh, later. So, and then the further south, they were following different art traditions. But even if people were having very different languages, they were having the same art tradition that they were sharing. Yeah, and so the Manil, the Manil is fortunate to be able to share a group of carvings from this region, from this region of Melanesia. And if we go to the next slide, we can see an installation shot of the gallery <coughs> that was installed this way in 2018. Um, and you see this, this, these are all objects representing the Melanesian region of the Pacific. And when you visit the Manil, uh, the Malagan carvings of New Ireland and Tabar are on view with these incredible other objects. So the next slide highlights those three particular objects that we're going to be addressing today. Um, and we have uh, a short video to share with you uh, that sort of allows us to go into detail with some of the objects. So I love this approach. <laughs> I love this approach towards the Uli figure. 
um, because the, the glare is so intense. The New Orleans figures have these eyes that are quite special, that are made of, by the operculum of a sea, of a sea shell. It's just, it's, there's an intensity to him. Um, and you see all these, the level of carving and uh, these, these really incredible ways of representing body proportions. And all this being carved within the one log of wood. So it's one piece. And then you have the, the Tatanua mask that we'll talk about a little bit later uh, that has this, that almost sort of references the shell of a snail with the, 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 the hair crest. So you see, there is a really very wide variety of materials that are being used for these kind of objects. And that's one of our favorite objects here at the Manila, the dance bustle. Um, but that's from that's from the Sepik ribbon. But this is from New York. <coughs> um, and this is the this is our Valik um, Equar that you that you've been raving about. So this is a very rare piece because this one uh, actually I don't know of any other uh, tall. A valid figure like that that are standing. So because normally they're often horizontal. So this one is an absolute exquisite, uh, rarest kind of uh, Malagan figure. And he's, and it's incredibly carved. I mean, you have these birds, these human figures, um, this lattice work that's been done, and it's vertical. It's it's incredibly tall for those of you who haven't been to the galleries. <laughs> but it should be about three meter tall, something like that. Yeah, it's it's quite quite tall. I'm not going to do the meter conversion online. <laughs> Um, but thanks to a lot of our conversations in the past, JP, we've been able to identify where these might be from in in uh, New Ireland and Tavar. Yeah, the for example, the the Malagan is very specific. When you have this kind of design, uh, you can say that it is belonging to the Valic tradition. So we're going to speak more about about it a bit after. Uh, but there are two main areas of uh, of origin, thanks to to the work of Michael Kern. Uh, one is from Taba Highlands, and the other one is from the coast. So you see this village called Hamba on the map. So from Hamba and uh, further towards uh, the north. So that's probably uh, where this uh, Malagan is coming from. The Tatanwa mask is uh, could be coming from anywhere in uh, the yellow area, uh, so northern New Ireland. But because it is a very early one, uh, most of the objects collected very early were collected around between Kapsu and Kevian. So maybe more for the north, but we don't know. But for sure, this one is one of the rarest, uh, oldest uh, Tatanwa that we know of. And the Uli, uh, this one is coming from the Mandak region. Uh, mm -hmm. So this area that is marked uh, in brown. Well, I think, so now we have an idea of where we are and what where these objects come from, or potentially come from in New Ireland. Um, why don't we take a closer look at the at the um, Valik Equar pole? Um, and I think maybe maybe what needs to be explained a little bit is that these are incredibly light, fragile objects. Um, they are not of um, cons uh, supportive works. They're not meant to hold up anything. They're meant to be placed on the facade of of the house uh, where the Malagan ceremony is being uh, uh, performed. Yeah, so there is there always is a presentation house, house that is being made, made and, they and they are attached to it. But they're not weight bearing. <laughs> no, not the big ones. <laughs> yeah. But in the photo, go ahead. The, the wood is, uh, it's a very light wood uh, called Alstonia. Uh, and uh, somehow it is easy to carve. So that's why the, uh, they're able to do this uh, absolutely fantastic. Uh, kind of hard work. Uh, the men that they started to have metal tools, they've been really able to go very, very uh, far in uh, in the skills of carvings. And also the carvers were had a really good incentive to uh, spend time in carving because when they were carving, people were taking care of their gardens, of their pigs. So basically, they only had to do is to carve. So you can spend months carving, that's fine. All mm -hmm. the domestic stuff is taken care of. And there was also prestige that you can compete with the other people. So that if you do, if you have better carving, so you have more prestige within the community. There's almost a competition of carving. Yeah, yeah. But and in the old days, artistic creativity in a way. Yeah. So following the codes, because you have to remain within the codes of the type of carvings you are doing, hmm. and it's very rigid. Because if you go outside, then there is a big, it's a big problem. So. Um, 
we, we just we just received a question and, and the question was, can you talk more about the materials you use to create these objects? So it is carved from the tree. Uh, so what you do is that you go to the forest, you cut a tree of uh, this Alstonia tree, uh, and uh, then you let it rest for a while in the forest, and then you bring it back singing the songs of uh, belonging to the carving you are going to make. And then uh, they are carving them with hadzis. In the old days, it was with hadzis we made with a clamshell or stone, uh, but uh, quickly it was also with metal. So it's uh, basically one trunk carved with hadzis. Then for, uh, they are using pigments, um, and these pigments are the black from uh, charcoal, red, which is from hawker, and uh, also some yellows that is not lasting very long so that you don't see it often on the old figures, and the white that is coming from the lime. So you are doing the painting using these different colors. And then you had uh, the operculum of this uh, sea uh, of this uh, sea snail. And, and the lime, the lime's coming from uh, the coral. So what you do is that you take coral that you burn, yeah, and then it makes a white uh, powder. If you do it with fresh coral, then it is sticking well, mixed with breadfruit tree. Uh, if you do it with old coral, then it is not as uh, sticky. So it's uh, it'd be the, so it's better to use fresh coral uh, as a base for your material. And then you need something that is sticky, which is mostly often uh, breadfruit uh, tree juice. Well, let's let's go to um, the next slide, so because we can actually look at some of these details. Um, sorry, if you can go to the next slide after that, the the we can actually look at some of these details of of the um, Velik Ekwar and um, it, the carvings and the materials that it's you, that's used to make it, um, so, and also the imagery. I think the imagery is really fantastic. So, you can uh, say very easily that it is a Velik. So, so you see, that's also everybody will know how to recognize a Velik in the museum now. Look at this uh, whirlwind structure that you have this concentric design here, uh, and it is completely carved. So this is the symbol of the Valik Malagan. So once you have a Malagan with that, with that design, you know that it is a Valik. And only the Valik has this kind of uh, whirlwind structure. In the middle, you have also a shell of, uh, of the, uh, sorry, this operculum of, uh, of sea snail. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you have two birds uh, who are actually drinking from this, uh, uh, from this whirlwind. The two birds are Drongo bird, which are family of the bird of paradise uh, found in New Ireland. And uh, what people are saying is that this, uh, uh, this secular structure is called the eye of the fire. So that's basically the source of power uh, during, uh, during the rituals. And is, is, there's a, is there a significance between that the birds are sort of latched onto it? Well, it's always, uh, if you ask the local people, they will say, well, it is this type of Malagan, therefore it is meant to be this way. So it's we don't have explanation for everything. Probably it has been lost uh, with the time. But what you see here is that you have uh, three uh, human figures, two male and one female, uh, and they are holding uh, the tails of these uh, uh, Drongo birds. Uh, normally, the, in Malagan, usually it's, uh, these figures are holding sticks. Uh, they are like that because that's the way the dead were being presented on the death chair. So in the old days, you were presenting the dead seated with your hand like that, with also a spear under the chin. And uh, that was a way to, to present the dead. Here, what's different is that uh, the, the figures are actually holding towards uh, the feathers of this bird. Yeah, and so but if we go to the next slide, where there's uh, this, this um, um, older photo of the Valik Malagan ceremony, um, and we can see that there's quite a difference between ours, the one, the one at the one at the Manil, and also the ones that were uh, displayed horizontally. So this photo was taken in Hamba, the village I mentioned earlier, yeah. in 1909. And uh, you see typical display of Valik Malagans. Different Malagans are presented in a different way. And most of the time, the Valik are horizontal figures. So that's what makes uh, the, uh, the one from the Menil uh, really special, that it's actually a standing figure, an Ikua, uh, totem pole, so it's a very rare one. And so, the the figures themselves, they're not actual, they're, they're personifications of ancestors, they're not portraits, they're not necessarily yeah. real people. So basically, the 
nowadays, uh, they would put several figures on the poll and then they would say, this figure is for this person, this figure is for this person. But they are not at all portraits. Uh, so it's an, evoca it's an evocation of, uh, of the deceased. So here you have two male, one female. Maybe it was because you had two, uh, it was for two dead men and one woman. But we don't know. But uh, for sure, there are no, there are never portraits of the deceased. There could be evocation of the deceased. And so, um, how, how did you come to learn all this about the particular Valique tradition of Malagans? So for this, well, I've got some uh, information from uh, from Edward Sally, and also from Michael Gunn, who, thanks to his fieldwork. So there is a lot of friendship involved in this, because uh, sharing knowledge. So you are collecting information, then you speak with other people, and then you come back, and then you say, oh, I didn't understand this, and then you ask. So it's a constant flow of exchange. Because what is different between astronomy and this is here it's humans. Mm -hmm. we, we have the law of mass and physics for astronomy, so it's very easy once you have just a small hint. Here it's, you are dealing with humans. So it's very important to be as close as possible to the facts, not overinterpret, and listen a lot. Yeah, listening is key. Yeah. I'm um, not directing I, things by questions. Mm -hmm. I, so the next slide is, um, but Edouard was was part of this really tradition as well. That's another so, reason, is it not? Yeah. So Edouard was a big Valik man. So he was really holding honing all the string of uh, of Valik Malagan. He was really owning a lot of Malagans, but Valik he was very strong in it. And um, so the photo on the left is from the ceremony in 2006. So you see, as he is, was always smiling, cheerful. Uh, he was entering the uh, ritual enclosure. Uh, in the middle, that actually a uh, Valley KQR that he carved in 2002. And uh, he didn't know the one from the Benil. Uh, but you see that it is supposed to have two figures, and the two figures have Drongo birds, exactly like the ones at the Benil, uh, and the Metellin uh, high of fire in the middle. Mm -hmm. And then, at, uh, sadly, so I saw him again uh, this year in uh, February, that he was. Uh, he was really tired and weak, but we still had uh, some time together. And he passed away in uh, October. And his son sent me uh, the photo uh, of the first step of his Malagan cycle. Because uh, it's important to keep in mind that uh, before bringing uh, Malagans on the Malagan house and having carvings, dances, etc., you need a lot of time for preparation. So you have different steps. The first step is after the death. A week after the death, you do a first small Malagan ceremony. And that's a photo of a small Valik Malagan ceremony done for Edward uh, late October. And there will be one day in two years, four years, six years, I don't know. There will be a big Valik feast uh, for him. And uh, we contributed to this feast because it was quite important uh, to acknowledge uh, what he taught us. Uh, so uh, we basically have been able uh, Mike and me uh, to basically send some contribution to his son and to the clans to say, well, we recognize that we learn from him, so we appreciate it, and uh, we're going to do our share in due time for the Malagan ceremony. Yes, so yes. somehow we are also part of the system. It's important to recognize when you learn from someone. Yeah, and um, and you'll be going back. Oh Probably. yes, for this I will go back. Okay. I don't know when, but. Um, yeah, we'll have to be there. And part of the reason for the duration of, this, of the festivals is because the families that are recognizing the deceased and also celebrating the transaction of uh, tr or transfer of, of, of knowledge and also uh, copyright is because they have to de keep the re de develop the resources. They have to accumulate the pigs. So we have, they have to uh, grow pigs uh, and you need big pigs for the ceremony, so you need several years to do that. And then you have to make planning so that you will, uh, will present this amount of carvings. We'll have these dances being ready. Uh, so the first is the pig and the garden part. And mm -hmm. once we know that they will have the right number of pigs and that the gardens will be ready, you know, oh, it will be this year. And that's when you start to really make more planning for the carvings. The carvings are not started to be prepared years in advance. They start a few months in advance. Right. And so, uh, part of the part of the carving is actually also making the masks for for the Malagan, and we have this wonderful Tatanua mask uh, uh, on view in the Manil. Uh, and the next slide shows sort of a detail of that mask, um, you know, with this wonderful crest um, and this really expressive face. 
But this is just one of the masks that is used during Maligan. And if we go to the next slide, uh, we have uh, a, sort, a full assortment of masks. This photos from the early 20th century, but it's it's a really wonderful portrait of the different types of masks that are used during the Maligan. <laughs> So you see the diversity is absolutely fabulous. Uh, you have some tatanwa, two tatanwa masks on these photos, but you have all sorts of masks, and they are serving different purposes, uh, and they are owned by different clans. So that's also part of the transaction, so that if you have a clan that is friend with another clan, he could give the right to one particular mask uh, during a ceremony. Mm -hmm. uh, so rights about uh, owning some kind of mask were also passed along, uh, along people. The Tatanwa are special because they are the ones that are used at the very end of a Malagan ceremony. So that's once you have completed, uh, where you have activated the carvings, you have presented it on the Malagan house, you have uh, shared the pigs. Uh, that's really the last step uh, of the Malagan ceremony. And I think in contrast to that, I just want to show a still from the, from the film or a photograph that was taken at the same time as the film of these amazing Tatanua masks that uh, are being being performed. And it, it's really interesting to point out, I think you should point out the, to the audience, the differences between uh, the types of uh, Tatanua masks that we're seeing, because there are a couple varieties. So you have four masks that were being danced for this particular ceremony in 2006. And you see, they are all different. You don't have two that have the same carvings, uh, but they were part uh, of the same group of dancers. and. Uh, the, these dancers are very skilled, so they are uh, the way it was uh, presented. It's a very dynamic uh, show uh, with uh, beautiful music and songs. And um, they, when people are doing it, they are really doing it in a very serious way. They are wearing also red shirts, uh, but uh, and it was also the case nearly hundred years ago. So as soon as uh, European fabrics started to be available, uh, mm -hmm. red shirts were starting to be used. Uh, for the dances and even to be put on some of the uh, artifacts. So hey, you see that you see that all over the world with like um, objects that are imported for trade purposes that become extremely valuable to those people. And if you take compare this with photo from nineteen thirties, uh, you just put it in black and white. And basically, you can be fooled. You say, "Oh, it was nineteen thirty." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but so, so, so some of the designs on on the Tatanua mask, uh, they represent. Uh, well, we don't really quite know what they all represent, but some of them represent cap cap uh, pendants. Or so you have season. some cap caps appearing on the sides. Cap caps are these big clamshell uh, uh, with tortoiseshell uh, designs. Uh, uh, others have some like mantis shrimp eyes. So they are really. Uh, really different uh, different shape but often they always have a square jaw massive so it's big face uh, they are somehow you always represent a fearsome warrior I think I think that's a good segue to like the, the this idea of the uli too because I mean the uli is this fierce being this this oh, fierce yeah. sculpture so what is it with ferocity and and uh, and uh, New Ireland well, we have to. In the old days, uh, there was also some uh, tribal fights. So it was, uh, uh, I would say, 150 years ago, it was quite rough. Mm -hmm. So people were. It was no, there were no things, things as strong as hand hunting in the in the Sepik, uh, but there were strong fights uh, between uh, different clans and different uh, different villages. Uh, also, the the fact that. Uh, um, the Malagans were also used in some cases to make peace uh, between uh, clans who have been at war uh, for some generations. I love that, like peace through art, transactional performances that really exchange the the value of the artwork. That's mm -hmm. so. I think maybe we should we should move on to this idea of the uli then, because I think ulis are very much in that vein of um, powerful figures that are involved in many different types of transactions. Um, and your book, which is coming out um, later this yeah. year. I would uh, say that oh, go ahead. probably before, before summer. Oh, before summer. <laughs> I hope so. Um, and we, we're looking forward to having it at the Manila Bookstore, too. And the, 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 the title of the book is Uli, Powerful Ancestors from the Pacific. So can you tell us a little bit about how you uh, started working on this book and um, what Uli figures are? 
So all the figures are a kind of monogam, uh, but very specific, as we will see with the examples after. Uh, they are always uh, human figures uh, depicting uh, powerful ancestors. And uh, they were always, they're coming from a small areas in New Orleans, so they were always very rare. And one of the specificity that unlike other managans, these ones were used multiple times. So these ones were kept and uh, reused. So I started to work uh, on them in 2012. And then I found in the German museums, in Tübingen, some very interesting uh, photos and then notebooks in Göttingen. And then I got uh, really hooked and I started to search very deeply. Uh, on, on the topic. So it was uh, a bit of a self, uh, I was going alone on this with the help of uh, Mike Gunn and Mario Melkor. And uh, then Pierre Mousse in 2017, hearing about uh, what I was doing, um, uh, told me that, well, uh, this should be made into a nice book. So then he organized uh, several people. He had the name Adam Lindemann, and then Antonio Casanovas, Bernard de Grun, Yves Deby. Uh, to support the project, uh, so that we could first go back to the field, so I did this with Mike, uh, to go and search for old ritual sites uh, in the hills, uh, go to all the museums and co basically get all the known woody to date. So we have a catalogue raisonné now of 226 woodies, um, and lots of old photos. And what is very specific about these objects is that for 150 of them, I have the name of the field collector on the spot. And for 70 of them, we have the name of the village. So that's, it means we have been able to really track them down uh, very, very far. Oh, that, 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 that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited to talk to you today, because uh, the research that you've done has been really instrumental in, in, in helping us understand our Uli figure, the, the Uli figure at the Manil now. And I think, um, Maybe we can talk a little bit about what uh, the form, the types of ulis that we, we see. So if we can go to the next slide. The, the, we have three examples um, of uli figures here. So three, so these are three superb examples. So you see uh, the power coming out of these objects. Mm -hmm. So what you have is that you have a fearsome wire uh, with a smile, but it's not a friendly smile. No. It's more the defiant smile of someone who is sure of his power and who may not have a very good intentions towards you. Uh, he had also large shoulders uh, and uh, a big penis and surprisingly also uh, a breast. So that's one thing that really triggered the interest of the German ethnographer. And they were, well, they were calling them the hermaphrodite figures and they were very curious because it's, it was looking a bit bizarre. So that's why uh, also they triggered the interest uh, of people early, early 20th century. Well, and especially but, surrealists like André Breton and... Oh, yeah, the André Breton had a wonderful example on his desk. So the, the artists have been very important also in promoting that first, the ethnographer, and then the, uh, and then the artists really brought them to light. And you talk a little bit about this in your book, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, I also have a shared section about uh, the, how they made their lives in Europe. So mm. uh, going to the collections of uh, artists, uh, in the first half of 20th century. It's, it's almost like they're being transacted again and again and again, almost very much like they would be in, in New Ireland in a way. It depends. Uh, for a number of them, when they arrive in a collection, they stay for three decades there. The people who uh, were their guardians offer and are really attached very strongly to them. Mm. And uh, it's not about money. It's really the, the often there is a strong bond uh, with the Uli that they are living with. But so, so in order to write this book and do the research, you spent many, uh, many, many months working in archives and, and, and um, libraries, work, reading these documents from um, old colonial German administrators. So if we can go to the next slide, we can see examples of some of these um, documents that you had to work through. <laughs> so the, one of the key findings was one of the German ethnographer named Augustine Kramer uh, was very uh, excited about Malagans and Uli in particular. So he went to the field to learn about them. And uh, <coughs> he was taking notes. So we found in Göttingen uh, 14 diaries. So this one is a diary number 10 called Uli, uh, with uh, all the information about Uli. And uh, what he did, he was in speaking with the local people and collecting information. So here on this page, you see 
uh, the first uh, type of woolies, because there are 12 types, so these ones are the first eight. <coughs> So there are the names being collected uh, by uh, by the local people. Mm -hmm. uh, the only problem is uh, it's not written in German. It's written in German with the current writing, current before being before the reform of the autograph of 1913. So it means the native German cannot understand it. Uh, <laughs> the only person I know who is able to read it fluently is Marion Melkor. She can read it, but uh, nobody else can. <laughs> That's amazing, and and he would uh, Kramer would take photos into the field and ask so, people what they were. So the next slide shows an example of a of a photo that he pasted so into. They, the journal. So the photo on the left is actually on the one of the woolies that you have seen before, on the, the one that was on the first page. So this woolie had been collected and sent uh, to Linden Museum in Stuttgart, and uh, the Carl von Linden was the founder of the Linden Museum. Sent photos to Augustin Kramer. Augustin Kramer glued these photos in a notebook, this notebook, and then he went to the field and asked people about it. So he was asking actually to people two years after this Uli has been bought. So people had good memories still about it. So if you look on the right, you see on the top uh, Selambungin, which is the name of the type of Uli, and then below you see written Avaknagang and some squids before. It actually means schnitzer, so that's a carver. So we have the name of the guy who carved it. And then, and this carver is from the Tegerod village. So we know that it has been carved in Tegerod by someone who has passed away uh, already a, a long time at the time of the, of the collect. Then it has been used for a ceremony for another guy. And then you have details about uh, different parts uh, of the Uli. Uh, so it's quite hard to decipher, but uh, and it has been never been published anywhere. Even Kramer himself didn't publish it, uh, but we are able to actually to to get it out and publish it for the first time uh, in a few months. That's fantastic, and and so this has been really instrumental for us because we've been able to apply some of this knowledge to the Manil, uh, to the Uli that's here at the Manil. Um, and if we can click to the next slide, uh, we can see sort of the front, back, and profile of the Manils, uh, the Uli that's at the Manil, uh, which you know, was was acquired in 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 the 1960s, uh, sort of at the height of um, uh, collecting for the Dimanils. and uh, we have in particularly the height of collecting for the oceanic uh, area of the permanent collection. And uh, it's a really interesting one because, and and we've talked a little bit about this, but it's not as frontal as many other examples. It actually has a natural kind of curve to it. Oh, that's a beautiful old example. Uh, the, there's been, and you see from uh, from his style also that it has been used uh, for a long time on the field before uh, mm -hmm. being collected. And uh, I was actually I knew it actually before. Then I asked uh, Paul for the photos, but then I did not. And then we realized that actually I knew uh, where this uh, Uli was coming from because from the archive work I did in Munich, uh, we have been able to figure out uh, the name of the person. Uh, who uh, got it out uh, from uh, from New Ireland? Yeah, so where our records only took it back to an anonymous anonymous collector in France. Working with you, we've been able to take it back much much further. Yeah, down and, to 1913. Yeah, 1913. And so now we know that this was collected by uh, a colonial administrator who you're very uh, familiar with. If you can go to the next slide, we can see. So here, that's a photo. Uh, taken of all the uh, colonial people in uh, uh, New Britain and New Ireland, photo from 1910. Uh, on the very left, you have Governor Hall with a big moustache. In the middle, uh, with, uh, with the medals, is uh, Franz Boluminski. So he was a colonial administrator in the north of New Ireland, in, uh, in Kaviang. And uh, he was uh, mad about Uli's. So he was uh, collecting, of course, uh, he was collecting oceanic artifacts. Uh, for uh, to be able to send them to museums and uh, the what is interesting is that he was buying these artifacts and uh, the governor actually at some point even complained that Boluminski was spending too much money into buying the artifacts <laughs> and uh, so and he was they, paying high prices too and also what is good is that the local people understood very quickly uh, that 
uh, since there was a demand for Moody's and different people wanted it, the prices increased very, very quickly. Mm. Uh, so we're speaking about uh, prices that were at the beginning something like 50 marks and then 150, 200, 400 and even 700 marks, which would be the equivalence of uh, 10 years or 20 years of salary of people working there. So, uh, so the prices both, uh, for which they were bought were very high. And uh, when they were then exchanged between museums in, uh, in Germany, they were exchanged at either the same price or even below. So, they, so they, what is uh, remarkable is that the New Orleans people understood very quickly because they had decided to, uh, to sell these artifacts. Unlike others, for example, you have other kind of Malagans that were systematically destroyed and that the colonial administrator were never able to buy. Uh, the only they were letting them go. Yeah. But and also not many of them, so that's why, because they were rare, people were speaking about them. So that's why you find letters. Uh, oh, I have found a Uli here. Oh, <laughs> oh, in the village I have seen three. Prices are so high, I can only buy one. Yeah. So you have these kind of letters. He said, prices are too high, I can only buy one. And, uh, and indeed, he bought one. So. So you know, this kind of uh, we have been able to reconstruct lots of uh, stories, also of the, between the interactions of the between the local people. Oh, that's fantastic. And, uh, so if we can look at the next slide, where these are two Uli figures that were collected by Karl Nauer and Franz Bolinski about the same time that the Manil, the one that's at the Manil, was also collected, correct? Yeah. So what happened is that Karl Nauer was a captain. He had a steamer and he was patrolling along the coasts in the archipelago and he was a very probably important collector and uh, so he sent uh, so these two photos have been taken on the deck of the Sumatra his ship uh, uh, most likely the same day and the one on the left has been sent to Munich by Karl Noah and the one on the right has been sent to Munich by Franz Boluminski uh, and it was sent to Munich uh, with the same shipment as the Uli from the Domenil uh, Museum so probably your Uli has been traveling with this one from New Ireland uh, to Germany. Fantastic. And so now when we look at our Uli, we, we have a really a, a deeper understanding of where it was from um, and uh, how it was collected. So if we can go to the next slide. We've actually been able to flesh out sort of the, the collecting history. And this is incredibly important for museums nowadays to really address these longer histories of objects and their end. Um, the, the, the travels of the objects, but it also has allowed us to identify particular parts of the Uli figure, the sort of I, the iconography of the Uli figure a little better with the notes by um, Kramer and others. So if you can go to the next slide, you can see that, uh, thanks, JP, you can explain all this. <laughs> the, so we cannot read the name here, but uh, thanks to the note of Kramer, we know what are the different, the name of the different parts uh, on the figure, so we have actually uh, the name, the Mandak name for the, any single different section of the figure, and in some cases also what it means. So, for example, the black on the face that you see, you have the eyes like that, and then it is running down the temples. Uh, these are war paints, uh, and uh, there is a name. So we're basically able to document uh, exactly what these figures are and what they are their meaning also for the local people. And, and Uli figures are incredibly diverse in, in sort of their figural representations. You have, we saw some on the earlier slide where there were uh, figures on the shoulders. Um, sometimes they're holding things. Sometimes the, the hand postures are different. And so each one has its own sort of um, iconography in a way, right? No, they are uh, actually it's more rigid than the Malagans. So you have really mm -hmm. 12 types, uh, whereas you have much more families of Malagans. So, you have these 12 big families, and they, most of them are really sticking within uh, their family. And there is really a unity uh, for the for the Ulis. So there. Yeah, so there's not a lot of diversity within those 12 different forms. So you have these different forms. Uh, within each form, uh, uh, there is really a continuity. Right. But indeed, the different forms are very different, so that you, there is no way you can uh, mistake them. So. This, this sort of brings into question sort of what was happening, what was life like in New Ireland in the early 20th, late 19th, early 20th century? What were these colonial administrators doing and what was going on um, with the indigenous people? And we have, uh, in the next slide, we can, we can talk a little bit about sort of how uh, colonial officials were living 
well, one particular colonial official, not all of them. So here that's the house of Franz Boluminski. When Franz Boluminski arrived in 1900, uh, he was living in a small hut, uh, but then he developed nicely uh, colonial, uh, colonial houses. So you see that's the house uh, that is on the, on the top. And uh, you might think, oh, with all this object that he's been collecting, uh, maybe we'll have some in his house. No, it is a pure Prussian house with a portrait of the Empress Victoria Louise. So you basically feel like you are in Germany, and there is also a piano. Uh, so basically, they were just having the comfort as if they would be at home in uh, in Germany. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind is that, uh, but you don't have photos of this. Is that on the uh, on top of this cliff, at about 50 to 100 meters on the left, there was the uh, first the German hospital, and then the hospital for the local people. And Frida Boluminski, the wife of the colonial administrator was actually working as a volunteer uh, for the uh, native people hospital. So they were, they were actually living together somehow. Um, and, and you also mentioned that, that Boluminski would actually hold ceremonies in front of his, his house. How Boluminski was able to get these objects. Uh, he was buying them, uh, but the, he also understood very quickly that to uh, to be recognized by the local people, the best way was to act like a big man in the local system. Uh, so he was organizing parades on the, uh, the area on the right. So, for example, local people would arrive uh, with some malagans and masks. Uh, they would do dances. So Boluminski would have the fly, the uh, the, uh, the flag being raised. He would have organized a patrol with his police force eight men with arms, so not much, but, and then uh, they would also play some German music, uh, so uh, to which the local people were answering with also some dances. So somehow uh, they, there were also some uh, some exchanges, and he was also, of course, buying the buying the artifacts. Yeah. At all, uh, since, and since he wanted them, then he was increasing the prices to kill the competition. Right. That makes that, that sounds that sounds uh, about right. The but he also wasn't the only person who was living or working. I mean, there was all these there were all these colonial administrators, a, a small a small contingent, but nevertheless they were there, and a lot of them were living in and amongst uh, the indigenous populations as well. So here you have uh, this photo shows Edgar Walden. So this one, he was uh, um, uh, an ethnologist working in the field. And uh, he wanted to learn from the people by being with the people so that uh, you are somewhere, you live for months and you speak to people and then you learn. So here is in Fesoa village, uh, seated with a woman uh, next to a child. Uh, and then on the left, you have uh, the, probably a guy with a chief with a cap <coughs> and some elders. So what I really like with this photo is that, you know, it's quite, it looks peaceful. And you, and you also see sort of a similar scenario with this, uh, the next slide, uh, with the war struck. So here, so that's a photo taken in 1910. So you see uh, about 20 Papua New Guineans seated on a small wall. So that's a wall around a ritual enclosure. And in the middle, you have someone in white, uh, and it's a woman. It's Marta Vostrak, age 25, was the wife of the colonial administrator, uh, Willem Vostrak. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what they were doing is that they were going to ceremonies uh, uh, when there were some in the areas, and in some cases they were collecting artifacts. So Vostrak sent a lot of artifacts to Linden Museum. But in this particular ceremony, what they say is that they wanted to they ask if they could buy the object at the end, and then the local people said no. <laughs> uh, so the objects have been destroyed, but we have the photos of, uh, of the objects. So we have the photos, and then we have the note of Vostrak saying, well, uh, they had to destroy it. So anyway, that's it. But we have the photos. So it means also that people were choosing objects to sell, objects right. to keep, objects to destroy. And in 2006, also at the ceremony, uh, one of the dances, the people had beautiful headdressed. And at the end of the dance, I asked, uh, well, if I could buy one. And they said no. And they burned them all. So at the very end of the, uh, of the dance, they put all their address together and they burned them. Oh. So, it's, uh, so, it, so it is also saying that uh, some objects were destroyed, others were sold, others were kept. 
that people are making their decisions. And people, yeah, people are making those decisions um, based on their own uh, needs and wants. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, this is this has been incredible. I, I uh, thank you, Jean Philippe, and uh, thank you to those who have supported uh, you in New Ireland for making this conversation uh, about Maligans possible. I think our viewers have learned so much about them and the traditions um, that come from New Ireland and Tabar. Um, I, I wanted to say also before before we close that your book will be available at the Manil Bookstore in later this year. So for those who are interested, please do come check check it out. And your film will be screening until January 21st. So uh, on manil.org. So definitely check that out as well. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to share stories uh, from the Pacific. And it's very important that these traditions are known. Uh, and uh, the objects that you have in the museums, uh, they've been created in a ritual, uh, with a ritual purpose. And uh, giving context and telling also the stories about the people that are linked to them, the people who made them, and the people who are still following the singing camp of rituals today is important. It's important to think that things are not dead and then we have a bridge uh, between the past and uh, and the and the present and it is a way also uh, to remind that we have to pay respect to tradition uh, to the elders and uh, live together that sound that sounds absolutely a perfect way to end this in dialogue so that brings this in dialogue to a conclusion but please join us next for the next one on wednesday february 10th when irina zuka alessandra alessandrelli uh, curator of Collezione Ramo in Milan joins Edward Kopp, the John R. Eckel Jr. Foundation Chief Curator of the Manila Drawing Institute for a conversation of works on view in the Manila Drawings Institute current exhibition, Silent Revolutions, Italian Drawings from the 20th Century. We look forward to seeing you online and at the Manila in the future. And until then, be safe, be healthy, and thank you. Thank you.